talking about here in just a little bit. Psalm chapter 10. Hey, babe, can I get some water? Um, Psalm 10. And we will pick up, thank you, ma'am. Pick up in verse number 6. Psalm 10, verse 6. Father, we thank you for this evening. Thank you for the chance to uh, get in your word tonight. Lord, thank you for my church family. Lord, I love these people. Lord, it's a blessing to be with them. Lord, let us never forget. Lord, I, I pray that, Lord, if you haven't come back, Lord, 20, 30 years from now, Lord, that we would remember nights like this and we'd smile. And uh, just thank you for your goodness. Thank you for giving us a place to worship you, Lord. Thank you for giving us a, a place to meet and study your word. And I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would illuminate and fill this place and fill these people and, and fill me. And Lord, let me not say anything that I don't need to say. Lord, let me say exactly what I do need to say. Lord, I pray that you'd uh, raise up some men and some women of God who, Lord, will take a stand for Jesus Christ, who will not be ashamed of you, who will speak up for you at work, who will uh, tell their neighbors about you, who will bring people to church, who will do what they can in these last days to reach people for, for the gospel. And Lord, just enjoy their Christianity. Lord, I pray you'd help us to do that now as we jump in this book. Thank you so much for it, Lord. Thank you. We don't ever have to doubt it. We don't ever have to, to wonder if it's true. We don't ever have to reinterpret it. Lord, thank you for giving us your perfect words. Uh, I feel like we're spoiled, Lord. I really do. And I just uh, want to say thank you tonight. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my wife, for my kids. And uh, Lord, just all the things you blessed us with. Lord, we have vehicles to get here, clothes on our back. Lord, we have each other, Lord. And uh, we're not perfect, Lord. We're not a perfect bunch, but Lord, we're, we're uh, uh, at least safe sinners. And Lord, I, I would take my chances with these people who have the Holy Spirit inside of them over anybody out in the world. Thank you for them. And Lord, I thank you for you being you, Lord, for being holy, for being righteous. And Lord, just for being merciful and for loving us. And pray that you bless us tonight as we get in the book of Psalms. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. amen, amen. All right, verse number six, it says, He has said in his heart. Now, again, who is the He? Does anybody remember? Who the he is? The Antichrist. There you go. You, you read about it there in verse 3. The wicked boasteth of his heart's desire. Verse 4. The wicked through the pride of his countenance. Verse 5. His ways are always grievous. Verse 6. And it's a continued thought. The continued thought, again, at, at the end of verse 5, he puffeth that. Then we talked about Puff the Magic Dragon and all the connections there with uh, uh, Leviathan. If you missed it last time, I encourage you to go back, maybe watch it on YouTube or something. Listen to it online. Uh, but it says in verse 6, He has said in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. And uh, there we talked about that last week, talked about, or last time we looked at this, talked about how the things that are said are first said in your heart, before they ever come spilling out of your mouth. And uh, you know the Bible says that God says some things in his heart? Now go back to Genesis, go back to the very first book of your Bible, and you'll find that, that it's not just man that does this. The Lord does this. Uh, before the words were ever brought to us in this book, God said these things in his heart. In the center of his being, God said these things. All right, look at Genesis chapter number 8. Genesis chapter number 8 and uh, verse number 20. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took... Let me say this, you ought to have a personal altar... This should be one of them right here. You ought you to spend some time here. I get nervous about a Christian who hasn't been in an altar in years. That makes me nervous. It does. When you can get to the place where the Word of God is preached and the Word of God is taught and nothing ever gets you to move, that's something wrong with that. Uh, you ought to have an altar in your life. But uh, it says here, Noah built an altar and took of every clean beast and a very clean fowl and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. And the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground anymore for man's sake. Isn't it a blessing that you get the words from God's heart in this book? Isn't that something? Because it says there, I, I believe it, the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart. There's so much in that verse. I mean, you could think about this. Do you, in your prayer life, as it's a prayer is pictured by incense, and incense was given up before the, the actual sacrifice was made on the altar. Your prayer is what should precede you giving of yourself to God. Does your prayer life smell sweet in the, in, 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 in the sight of God? I can tell you this, and I, I'm not trying to kick you. I, I praise the Lord if you do anything in prayer. 
But if your prayer life is like this, Lord, bless me, give me a good day, thank you for this, thank you for that, in Jesus' name, amen, you're missing out on real fellowship with the Lord. And, uh, and, and, and the other thing that's really interesting here is that I think about this, what does God say in His heart about me? If you could have God's words from His heart brought to you in a book, what would it read like? Because it was Noah's actions that caused God to say something in his heart. That's pretty thought-provoking. But the point is this, either way, men are a fallen version of the image of God. The perfect image of God is found in Jesus Christ. All right? The Bible says, Whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of, of, God, uh, of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus Christ is the image of God. All right? We're a fallen version of it. So if God speaks to himself in his heart, guess what we do? Same thing. Uh, look at Psalm 14. Psalm 14. That's why you hear preachers say that, you know, they say things like you need to get your heart right with God, and you can hear that for over and over, and you get sort of desensitized to it. Uh, but that's where everything comes from. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. That's why... Uh, when you find yourself saying something, you go, oh, I can't believe I said that, I can't believe that came out. The reality is it's been in there for a long time. And something triggered you to let it loose. <laughs> um, it says in Psalm 14 and verse 1, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Look what it says here. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. Now, what is that? That's God, this, God's description on, on what happens after a man's heart is in the condition that it's in. All right? The man's condition, the condition of the man's heart is he's speaking to himself saying there's no God. You know what I believe an atheist does? He says there's no God. There's no God. There can't be a God. I prayed to God and he didn't answer my prayer. That conversation goes up for a long time before which time he gets to the place where he says, I don't believe in any God. And usually what you find with an atheist is that they at one time did believe in God, and God wasn't the genie in the bottle of the Santa Claus that they were hoping He would be, really. And their heart is broken over it, and they turn on God. But the Bible says the fool is in his heart. Again, what, the question tonight is, what do you say in your heart when no one's around? All right, about the Antichrist, look there at Psalm chapter number 10. The Antichrist says in his heart, I shall not be moved, for I shall never be in adversity. Talked about saying, <laughs> learning to never say never. That's a good thing. All right, look at verse number 7. His mouth, again, we're describing. Again, verse 5, his ways. Verse 6, he has said in his heart. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. You know what you learn about the Lord? The Lord is honest. The Lord is true. Um, look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter number 7. You know what a fraud is? A fraud is someone that breaks a covenant. The Lord is not for that. The Lord is for keeping your covenant. Deuteronomy chapter number 7. You say, well, duh, of course. You know, sometimes the way some Christians deal with things, you wonder, which God are they, you know, trying to display? Uh, we find a way to justify getting out of covenants all the time. When the Lord makes a covenant, He keeps it. Thank God for that. Aren't you glad God didn't wake up? And say, you know what, Bella, I think you're going to go to hell today. I just didn't like the way you acted. You know, you're just, you're done. You're toast. Aren't you glad he didn't do that? I'm glad he didn't do it to me this morning. He could have. I mean, if you want, it, thankfully, thankfully, he has bound himself to his word. You say, what is that? That's his covenant. But I'll tell you what, uh, thank God that he made a covenant with us that if you're in Christ, you're secure, you're safe. Uh, look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 and look at verse number 9. Know therefore... That the Lord thy God, He is God, the faithful God, which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love Him and keep His commandments to a thousand generations. Man, that's good. Um, but I want you to understand the Antichrist is there to do quite the opposite. Uh, for sake of time, I won't have you go there. But in Revelation 20, if you're taking notes, in verse number 8, it says that the, the devil goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. All right? The devil's job, he is the deceiver. Now, here's what you have to deal with. Jacob is a great... Jacob, you guys remember Jacob who becomes Israel? Jacob is called... His name means supplanter. It means deceiver. And Jacob is a great picture of the flesh. Think about this. He wrestles with God. After he wrestles with God, and God touches him, 
and God cripples his flesh. Think about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, you know what? He was a great man of God, but you know what you need to learn about him? He had an infirmity in the flesh that he wrestled with God over. And he wrestled with the Lord. He wrestled with the Lord. And you know what the Lord told him? My grace is sufficient for thee. He didn't even heal him. There's your faith healer right there. God himself didn't heal Paul. He said, my, my grace is sufficient for thee. And he wrestled with God, and after which time his flesh was subdued to God's will. God could use him. You know what happens with Jacob? He yields to the Lord. He touches the, the hollow of his thigh. And you know what the Lord says? Your name's no more Jacob. Now it's Israel. And now you're no longer a supplanter or deceiver, but now you're a prince with God. You know what that's a great picture of? A Christian that learns to submit his flesh in wrestling with the Lord to the Lord himself. And uh, you say, what happens? Well, when a, when a person does that, uh, they are changing position. But by nature, you, you, are, you know what we are bent towards? Deceit. Deceit. You know what we like? We like someone telling us how great we are. You say, why? Because we just want to hear it. If we're honest, that's what we want. All right? Uh, it never gets old, somebody saying, I will tell you this. After a while, it does get a little icky. Am I right about that? When someone butters you up a little bit too much, you just start to know that. Eh. When you get in the Bible, here's what I've learned. I, I've watched some of your faces, all right? And, and I've learned this. I, and this is, this is a blessing to me. This is a blessing to me. Uh, I have seen the Word of God go out and affect your life and change you. And I've seen people that are just almost borderline icky with how overly you're so wonderful. And I watch your reaction. It's almost like, I think I'm going to leave. <laughs> and you know what? I sit back and go, praise the Lord. They're learning something. Amen. I mean it. But we're bent that way. We're bent towards deceit. And the devil's job is to go out and deceive. Look at Job chapter number 41. Again, talking about that, that dragon character, if you will, that we talked about last time. Job chapter 41. And uh, here you read about Leviathan. And you read about the character, again, the character of Satan himself. The Bible says he's the king over the children of pride, as, as, as demonstrated through Behemoth. Uh, and it says here about the Antichrist in Psalm uh, chapter 10, His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Look at Job, uh, Job chapter 41. Job 41, look at verse number 1. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook, or his tongue with a cord which thou lettest down? Now let me just stop here again. I appreciate creation scientists and the positions they take on, you know, debating with evolutionists and all that. But if a creation scientist tells you that Leviathan is a dinosaur, please don't believe him. All right? And here's why. Look what it says in verse, uh, verse 4. Will he make a covenant with thee? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Uh, look down at uh, verse number, uh, let's see here. Verse 15, his scales are his pride. Who's the king over the children of pride? Satan. <laughs> I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Isaiah chapter 14. All right. Uh, look, if you would, at verse number 19. Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go a smoke as out, as out of a seething pot or a cauldron. Uh, let's see here. Look at verse 24. His heart is as firm as a stone. You say, what is that? Tough. Doesn't want to break. Doesn't want to yield to God. Um, look at verse 31. Is this a dinosaur? Really? He maketh the deep to boil like a pot? Does a dinosaur have the power to do this? Do you understand what deep he's talking about? He's talking about the deep that's up there. There's a deep above you. All right? Uh, he says, he maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. Upon earth, verse 33, upon earth there is not his like who is made without fear. He beholdeth all th high things. He's a king over all the children of pride. Do you know what you were before you got saved? Ephesians chapter 2. You were a child of disobedience. This is a reference not to a dinosaur, but the devil. <laughs> now I want you to notice what he says about this character in verse 4. Will he make a covenant with thee? He may make one, but he'll break it with you. The devil's a deceiver. He'll tell you if you leave your spouse and you, you'll be happy. I was talking to my boss today and I use all kinds of, it's a blessing. I'm glad that I'm in the position I'm in, being able to talk Bible left and right. I said, you know the problem with people. I said, uh, talking about greener grass and I gave him an illustration of, of uh, Lot. He goes, no, I never heard that story in the Bible before, you know. And Lot looked over here and he saw this. I said, everyone, I said, you know what the, the, the guy who doesn't have the word of God to lead him thinks? 
That lady down the street, boy, if, if she was my wife, boy, I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. Until you marry her, you'd be happy. Right. You know what the devil does? He'll deceive you. He'll make you think, if I just had this, if I just had this. He'll make a covenant with you. If you have this, you'll be happy. No, you won't. No, you won't. And you know what he does? Uh, I, I believe that it's, it's uh, very possible that when you look at the tribulation, I believe the devil's going to do everything he can to deceive the nation of Israel, deceive the very elect, Matthew 24 says. I believe he'll try to make a covenant with them, but he won't be sincere about it, just like he's not sincere with you. All right? That's why I believe Job 41 mentions Leviathan being someone who you can't make a covenant with. Think about this. The book of Job has how many chapters? Look in your Bible. Look there. How many chapters are in Job? You know how many months are in the book of tribulation? Uh, 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 you know how many months are in the, the time of tribulation? Great tribulation? 42 months. That's three and a half years of great tribulation. You know what's interesting about Job? Job loses everything, and it looks like he's about dead, and God basically has to raise to life a new family for him. You see, what is that? Ezekiel 37, the Valley of Dry Bones with the nation of Israel. They're look, it looks like they're forsaken. All their enemies forsake them. They're attacked by Job, like the nation of Israel, is attacked by the devil himself, and it's the Lord that has to rescue him in the end and prove the people that came around him as wrong. You know what Job has to do? He has to pray for them. You know what the nation of Israel does? They will pray for those nations that were against them. And those nations that want to, to be right with God in the millennium have to come and observe the feast just like the nation of Israel. And if they don't do it, they don't get rain on their crops and they don't have God blessing them, so on and so forth. You say, what is that? That's called typology in the Bible. And the Bible's full of stuff like that. That's why the Bible is such a neat book. Uh, so, back to Psalm chapter number 10. Psalm chapter number 10. His mouth, the Antichrist, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and fraud. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever let your flesh or the devil or the world let you think that TV has anything better than the Bible. It doesn't. Or that any form of entertainment is more exciting than the Bible. I'm going to stop here and just ask you this. Now, you don't, please don't raise your hand. Please don't, you know, whatever. This is between you and God. But how many of God's people, and you, listen guys, you're, and I'm not trying to puff you up, but you're the cream of the crop. You at least know which book is right. You at least know what sound doctrine is. And of those who are even in this group, how many of us will spend more time watching a, a game? Or a movie? Or a show? Or the next installment of whatever thing on YouTube or Netflix or fill in the blank? More time than in this book. Why is that? Because somewhere along the way you were convinced that that's more exciting than this, and it's not. By the way, I will say this. I can't find a good Hollywood plot that didn't steal half their material from the Bible. Seriously. Half the stuff comes from the, the book, and they don't know it. They don't realize it. Uh, Psalm chapter 10. That was for free. <laughs> Psalm chapter 10. It says in verse number 8, he sitteth in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret, look at that, in the secret places doth he murder the innocent. His eyes are privily set, that means like privately, secretly set against the poor. Um, out in the open, you know what the Antichrist is? He's all about peace. Look at Revelation chapter number 6. We were uh, visiting with some folks that are helping to... Uh, well, I'm going to throw out a prayer request. Please pray that our black horse... See, it's a picture of something evil in the tribulation. Pray that our black horse sells. We're trying to sell this horse. We're visiting with this family, and they're believers, and uh, their daughter really isn't a horse. They said, okay, quick. All right, where does the white horse show up in the Bible? Uh, uh, Revelation. I said, right. I said, but is there only one? She goes, I don't. I, I, uh, no, no, there's another one. There's another one. I said, well, what? I said, who is it? She goes, oh, Dad, help me out. He's like, I'm not helping you. You know, her dad's right there. And, uh, and finally she goes, oh, it's it. Because I gave her some clues. This is the Antichrist. And I said, yeah. I said, now where does that show up? She goes, I, I don't, I know. I know the other one's at the end. I said, you're right. Jesus Christ is toward the end. I said, but this one, Revelation chapter 6, uh, is here. Revelation 6, look at verse 2. And uh, the moral of the story is just because a guy shows up on a white horse doesn't mean he's the right guy. Right. Amen. Uh, and I saw, verse 2, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. And a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now here's what's interesting about this person riding this horse. He has a bow. It's almost like you took two of my kids' interests. One likes to shoot things, and one likes to ride things. 
<laughs> and uh, amen. I, I'm teaching them to defend themselves. You boys are icky. Shoot them. Ask questions later. All right. <laughs> uh, but uh, there in verse two, it says that he had a bow. He had a bow. Notice he has a bow, but he has no arrows. All right. You say, what is that? I'm coming in peace. I'm not coming to hurt you. All right. You see, what is that? That's exactly how the Antichrist shows up. Look at Daniel chapter number 11. Daniel chapter 11. Watch out for the characters on the world stage that are always trying to get the world together through... Uh, now, I know what I'm about to say may sound like taboo. Um, I'm thankful to live in a nation that regardless of your background or race, you can, be, you can succeed in life and you can move all that kind of stuff. All that aside... Understand that what the left has been pushing on our country called multiculturalism is actually cultural Marxism. Here's, here's what you need to understand. I'm going to give you some of these stuff. You're like, oh, I'm checking out. Now you're boring me to death. Here's the thing. What the Marxists, what the communists in Russia tried to do is they tried to infiltrate America with this. The oppressor versus the oppressed. And back in the 50s and 60s, that really didn't work. Because you know what people saw? If they worked hard, they could make it. And not everybody was sucking on the government at that time. It wasn't that bad yet, okay? So they saw, so this whole oppressor versus the oppressed, they saw through it and they go, this is stupid. But then they said, okay, let's turn black against white and white against black. And let's do this and let's pit this group against this group. I want to say something that may offend some of you. I don't believe there should be a Latino caucus in Congress. And I'm a Latino. You say, why? Are we one country or are we 50? Right? Right? See what happens, but they're, 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 we bring everything together, and what they do when they bring everything together is they actually divide everything more than anything else. Right. <laughs> right. All right, Daniel chapter 11, look at verse number 21. Daniel 11, look at verse 21. And in his estate shall stand up a vile person to whom they shall not give honor, the honor of the kingdom, but he shall come in peaceably and obtain the kingdom by, woo, flatteries. You're so wonderful. The world's a better place. We're advancing upward and onward man is getting better if we can just come together and we can really rid the world do you know that the president uh and i just i had to go back and look it up and make sure i didn't hear something on the radio that wasn't true the president wants to eliminate all traffic deaths by 2030 or something i thought okay well number one here's a good place to start liquor but they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole they won't do it they won't do it i thought okay if you really want to do that you know what the, you know what the answer is Self-driven cars. That could never go bad. <laughs> you know, robots running your life. That, I'm sorry, I've seen way too many movies. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. All right. Uh, but you know what that is? We're going to play God. We're going to eliminate. No, you, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do just like you're not going to eliminate cancer. Uh, Daniel chapter 11, look at verse number 32. Daniel 11, and you know what? You say, Pastor, I can't believe you said that. Don't you want to get rid of breast Yes, I do. But if you get rid of that, if you get rid of breast cancer, you know what's going to pop up? Something else. Now you think, oh, that's so negative. I'm negative about the human race. Yes. We can't do anything right without God. And guys, I'm sorry, but God said it was going to be that way. How are we going to overturn that? You know? Now, am I for cancer research? And if you can find a way to help people, sure, fine, fine. But you're not going to ever convince me that you rid the world of all sickness. Just like you can't rid the world of all poverty. And the, the way that the, the media and the left, their idea of doing so is you take from those that have and you put it over here. It doesn't work. You're not creating any more wealth. You're just shifting it from one place to another. And typically all that does is it makes a slave class of people who are dependent on these people over here. It doesn't bring any freedom. The world's answers to the problems today aren't going to work. I remember the Wayne Chambers preaching on the street over here, which way I'm going, over here on the corner of Hamden and Chambers. And I remember him, there's something that sticks out in my mind, him saying... Uh, the, the world's problem today is the same problem it's always been. The biggest problem today is not poverty. The biggest problem today is not violence. The biggest problem today is not the left. The biggest problem today is not the right. The biggest problem today is what it's been since the beginning, and it's sin. Amen. 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 Uh, look at Daniel 11, and look at verse 32. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God... There's the Jew and the Gentile that get saved in tribulation shall be strong and do exploits. Look at verse uh, 34. Now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help. But many shall cleave to them. Look at this. With what? 
You see, there's that, that's cursing and deceit and fraud. And on the open, it's like, I love you, and you're so wonderful. Here's what I've learned. The preacher that will rip your face off publicly but, pry with, but cry with you privately, that's the man to follow. The preacher that will tell you how wonderful you are and butter you up from the pulpit and could care less about you in your personal life, he just wants your money, run. Amen? Um, so, again, there's a couple things in, in, in Psalm 10 uh, that we're looking at here. One is his practice of cursing and deceit and fraud. He's a fraud. He shows up to be one thing, but he's another. All right? Um, a wolf in sheep's clothing, if you will. The other thing is it talks about him lurking in secret places. Let me say this. Jesus Christ didn't do his stuff in secret. If a Christian, if you have to, if you have to do anything, and you find yourself have to do this in secret, you know, uh, there's something wrong with that. If you're having to look over your shoulder, I told, I told the people that work in my company, I said, look, if you have to toggle the screen when I walk by, you have to live with yourself. You have to go home in the mirror and look at yourself and say, I'm a fraud. I said, I'm not going to, I won't even say a thing to you. I'll let you keep doing it. Said, but you have to live with that. If that's what you want, go ahead. And then after that, how many people come into my office? They thought I was a Catholic priest confessing all this. Like, I, don't, I don't know all this stuff, man. <laughs> uh, but look at John chapter 18. John 18. John chapter 18. I love when they ask me, how was Mass on Sunday? I said, I don't know. I don't go to Catholic Church. <laughs> John 18, uh, look if you would at verse 20. By the way, you know what kicked off the conversation at lunch about, about the healing thing was that one of the, my coworkers' uh, wife or girlfriend, fiance, whatever it is, I don't know, uh, significant other, she, her family was, is Catholic from South America, from Peru, and uh, he had gone to a healing Mass where they mix charismaticism with Catholicism. You talk about it. I'm, I'm, if you think what I'm about to say is a stretch, it's because you haven't studied it, but I promise you that's pretty much voodoo. It takes, if you look at Catholicism, you look at Santeria, you know what Santeria is, right? It's a mix of Catholicism with voodoo, and it's this healing, and it's magic, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, you do this, you, 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 you say these words, and you can get healing. Guys, that's not biblical. That's, that's voodoo stuff is what that is. Matter of fact, one of the greatest people in, in, in reference to how to really look at charismaticism that I've ever met is our missionary Mike Dobbins. Because he was down there in Africa with all that voodoo stuff. He said, brother, the Pentecostal church in Zambia and the people who practice voodoo, what people realize after a while is there's very little difference. Dangerous stuff. Now again, going back to the secret thing, look at John 18, look at verse number 20. Uh, Jesus answered him, well, verse 19, the high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples, and of his doctrine. By the way, you know what people ought to be able to ask you about? Who you hang with and what you believe. Amen. Amen. And that's how you're going to be known. Uh, verse 20, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. That's how you live your life. I ever taught in the synagogue. No one should ever say, oh, you're a Christian. That should be a given. That should, they should know. Uh, no one should ever say, oh, I didn't really take it for one of those church-going people. Uh, you know what they should say every once in a while? I didn't think a Christian would say what you said and tell me that I'll go to hell without Jesus Christ. Now, that's okay. That's all right. Uh, but uh, look what it says here in verse 20. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. I have a policy at my company. You're going to get tired of these illustrations. I'm sorry. Uh, but I just got put in a different position. I said, here's the thing. I said, if I see any closed doors, and psh, 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 uh, then we're going to have a conversation. Uh, because when you have to do that, you're not helping anybody. You're, you're destroying the morale of your team. If you've got a problem about your pay, don't go to the guy who can't pay you to talk about it. Amen. You know, it's like when someone has a problem with the preacher and they go talk to another Christian about it. They're not going to help you. You're just going to destroy their morale in their church. Jesus says there in verse number 20, In secret have I said nothing. You guys want to nail me? Nail me for what you already know I said. You guys know everything. I said it in front of you. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter number 5. Ephesians chapter 5. The things that are done in secret, honestly, what the Bible, the Bible's perspective on them, uh, you know crime surges at night. Did you know that? Because man has this false sense of security like they can't see me. You, listen, listen, listen. Go down to downtown Nashville. Nash I was just in Nashville. Downtown Denver. All right, go there during the daytime, and then you go there back at night. You don't tell me it's a different city. 
Same thing for Nashville, same thing for New York City, same thing for any metropolitan city. You go at night and it's a whole different vibe. You say, why? Because man thinks he's getting away with something because it's nighttime. He can do things in secret and God's not going to see it. It isn't going to work that way. But I'll tell you this, the things that are done in secret, and I said this a couple weeks ago, maybe it offended somebody, there are some things that used to be in the closet that probably need to stay there. Ephesians 5, look at verse 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. Hey, listen, if you have to constantly guard what, you know, uh, guard what's, uh, what you're, you know, um, I, I don't know how else to get, out, get this out there, but just come out and say it. I've known Christian men who won't let their wives look at their computer. What do you got to hide, bud? Amen. Amen. What do you got to hide? I knew a guy that wouldn't let his wife open the mail. What are you so scared of? Oh, she submission. No, she, no, 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 no. This is not about submission. This is about you being a little psychotic because you've got some things to hide. Yeah. Uh, and if you live your, your life like that as a Christian, there, there's, there's something wrong. It shouldn't be a secret that you go to church. It shouldn't be a secret where you go to church. I know sometimes you wish you could hide me, you know. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but really, it, shouldn't, it should never be a shock to anybody that you're a Christian. Your life should be open. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, you don't turn there, but it says in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Ye are our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You're an open letter is what you are. You ought to be. All right? Uh, now, look at Matthew 24. Let me show you how this, all the secret stuff all ties in with the tribulation, okay? Matthew 24. Matthew 24. In the Word of God, good. <laughs> it's neat how it all connects, I think. Matthew 24. And we will read a few verses here from verse 24 to verse 27. Verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ. What is that? That is an antichrist, right? For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders. Just because someone has a power doesn't mean that they're the one to follow. In, by the way, uh, <laughs> I was at Barnes & Noble a couple weeks ago. And I couldn't believe this. Right in the family game section where they have all the game boards. You know, it's right in the middle. Right in the middle. Ouija. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kids would mess with that stuff. I know it was big, big in the 80s and the 70s. And they'd play with this stuff because, you know what, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. Just because it's powerful doesn't mean that it's of God. Uh, there's unclean power. But uh, there in, in Matthew, I want you to look at this. It says here in verse 24, Insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. That's... Not the body of Christ, but rather the nation of Israel. If you want to write a cross-reference, Isaiah 45, verse 4 gives that to you. Behold, I told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, look at this. Behold, he is in the desert, talking about Christ. What, uh, what Christ is doing is he's warning them that before he comes back, there are going to be people that say, oh, here, here's the Christ. Oh, here's the Christ. And these are going to be false Christ. Don't believe them. And when they say, behold, he's in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the, look at this, secret chambers. Believe it not. You say, why? Because the one that's lurking in secret is not the one you want to follow. The one that shows himself openly to the world when he comes back, that's the one to follow. And the Bible says, every eye shall see him. It says in prophecy, talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. All right? And of course, uh, back to Psalm chapter number 10, of course there he talks about at the end of that verse, his eyes are privily set against the poor, and we talked about that already. Uh, verse number 9, we'll probably stop here in verse 9, it says, uh, he lieth in wait. I promise you we, we do some Lion King conversation tonight, so I don't want, I don't want to disappoint you. Uh, it says there that, uh, uh, let's see here, he lieth in wait secretly as a lion in his den. And you remember the story about Daniel and the lion's den, all that kind of good stuff. Uh, obviously, uh, Jesus Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. But Satan himself, 1 Peter 5, 8, all right, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring what? Lion walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Now go to Zechariah chapter 11. Zechariah chapter 11. And then we'll look at, after Zechariah, one more verse in Psalms, and we'll be done for the night. Zechariah chapter 11.
And you may remember from the Lion King that there was a good lion and there was a bad lion. And now, now listen, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not telling you that Disney's been reading their Bible. God knows they're the last people that would open a Bible. But, uh, but I'll tell you that there's stuff in movies they don't even know where it comes from. And it's a biblical concept. You have uh, the son that goes away in exile, and he's chased away by the bad guy, right? And everybody thinks that the son will never return. They think he's dead. Matter of fact, that's what the bad guy tells everybody. He's gone. He's dead. You have to listen to me. The world is screaming now, God's dead. God's dead. Get rid of him in our schools. Get rid of him in our, from our society. He's gone. And then the king came back. Am I right? And what does the king do? He destroys the guy with the bad eye. He destroys Scar. Look at Zechariah chapter 11. And look at verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. Now, I did my research, and I'm, uh, unfortunately, I have to report the truth. Scar had a bad left eye. I did look that up, okay? Uh, but, but the point is, you got a lion, a false lion, a false Christ, who has a bad eye. And so there's that picture there with Scar. So there you, there you go. There's the, the Bible from the Lion King, all right? Look at uh, Psalm 22, Psalm chapter 22, and we'll close with this. In the Bible, uh, certain animals are pictures of certain things, and... Um, Psalm 22, I want you to look at uh, verse number 11. This is a, what we call a messianic psalm. All right? It's not messianic because it's a mess. It's messianic because it describes the prophecy that's related to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Um, you can see this in verse 1 to get the context. Psalm 22 and verse 1. And it says here, and this is David speaking, but this is what we call double application. David is speaking. He's going through trouble in his own life. But it doesn't just apply to history in David's life, but future prophecy. That's the doctrinal application of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my what? Like a lion. But a lion that's been slain. Now look at, uh, look at verse number 12. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring what? So there's a good line and there's a bad line, all right? And so you see there that uh, I believe that the Lord is, is uh, or David is describing some things that the Lord uh, went through. Now, I believe personally that the bulls and, and the lion is a reference to spiritual things that are going on there at the cross. You say, well, why couldn't it be the Roman soldiers? Here's why I think it's not the Roman soldiers. Look down as Psalm 22 and verse 16. Dogs in the Bible are a picture of Gentiles. Remember the Syrophoenician woman that came to Jesus Christ? And he said, It is not meat to take of the children's bread and cast it on a who? Dogs. Who is she? She's a Gentile. So I think the dogs there in Psalm 22 is a reference to the Roman soldiers and the Gentiles that surround him there. But those bulls and those lions, I think that's a reference to Satan and his, and his angels that are there attacking Jesus spiritually when he's there at the cross. So... Uh, again, uh, you have a good line in the Bible, that's Jesus Christ and a bad one. And it goes on, we'll get into this next week, uh, how that lion uh, waits secretly in his den, how he catches the poor and he catches them and draws them into his net. So we'll get into that uh, next week. Any questions before we close out tonight?